Welcome to another episode of A Pint with Shawnee B. Today coming to you all the way from New York again. My guest today, a very bright guy by the name of Dave Richardson. Dave and I worked together in the city back in 2011. He's a pure supremo and still works in the public relations business. Today we're not here to talk about that, though. We're here to talk about his other interest, which is in a school called the Institute of Hermetic Philosophy, a educational program that believes in the power and promoting the power of consciousness in society, something that is, we all know, sadly lacking these days. So something I don't know an awful lot about, and I was uh, really keen to find out all about it, and I think you'll find it's a enlightening conversation. So without further ado, I give you Dave Richardson. So welcome, Dave. Thank you. Good to be here. Let's start with the big news that you did when you left, uh, you left public relations. Mm-hmm. And I know you still work in PR. Mm-hmm. But you set this uh, school up. Tell me about mm-hmm. what, how you decided to do that, and mm-hmm. what it is. Well, it actually the school that existed before. You oh, know, okay. So it's, it's um, there's a teacher in Santiago, Chile. His name is Dario Salas Summer, uh, and he's the philosopher who founded the school about okay. 50 years ago. Ah. And I've been in the school for about 20 years in the New York okay. branch. School yeah. versus religion. Discuss. It, yeah, it's religion is more like dogma. Think about it like, a, like I'd say, a spiritual gym. Uh, a lot of us, if we talk about consciousness, right, I think we come to this planet and um, we're conditioned by almost everything around us from the instant we get here. Uh, you know, subconsciously by our parents telling us what to fear and what not to fear, yeah. by traumas, dogs, or anything that happens yeah, to us as a child, kids. the news, television shows, the whole Disney princess thing, obviously our business in yeah. advertising. We're the you worst know. offenders. Yeah, exactly. Uh, education. I mean, everything sort of gives us a point of view, and especially before we're seven, before we have any kind of volition, the stuff just gets embedded in us, yeah. in our deep in our subconscious, and we really have no way to discern that after a while unless we really take a, a, a serious look at ourselves yeah. and really question all of our assumptions about life and unfortunately yeah. very few people do that it well, ends up I'm, being I'm, the, the water we swim in and you don't really notice it I'm glad we're having this conversation because I'm Irish mm-hmm. and uh, I'm, I'm also 40 something and mm-hmm. most 40 something Irish people I would say would agree with me that the most damage that has been caused to us has been the whole Catholicism yeah. and Ireland thing mm-hmm. Which is very hard to shake out yeah. from under because it's guilt-based. Yeah. And, and also lots of other things, yeah. of course, that happen with, with mm-hmm. uh, priests diddling with kids and yep. all that. Uh, go back to this guy in Peru for a mm-hmm. second. Is he mm-hmm. some sort of guru kind of guy? Or? I wouldn't say guru. I mean, I'd call him philosopher. I mean, okay. it's Chile. Uh, Santiago, Chile. Uh, Chile, sorry. No problem. Uh, and he is just a guy who uh, I would say, for one reason or another, just was a little more conscious right. earlier than, than a lot of us. And but let's start written, with this. What, yep. t- tell me what he and you guys mean by mm-hmm. conscious. Great. Um, if you think about all that conditioning I was telling you about, yeah. think about that as like the gunk on the windshield of your car. Okay. <laughs> you know? So it's like you can't really get a clear yeah. picture of yeah. the world, of life, of anything around you because you're looking through all these different things that mm-hmm. are filtering reality at the end yeah. of the day, whether that's the religion, whether that is... You were told earlier on to fear black people, white people, Chinese people, whatever mm-hmm. it is, whether, you know, whatever happened, the traumas that happened, relationship issues that happened, yeah. all those things color the way in which you interpret reality. Right. Um, so when things are happening in the world, it's going through all those filters. Really, it's about cleaning out all that stuff that, that is between you and what's actually happening in the world. And unfortunately, because each person has his own gunk. It's usually one person communicating through his gunk, through your gunk, and then yeah. finally to you. And so communication, which is why we have such a hard time communicating, right? Which is yeah. why the world, we really what, what, what don't do you say to very often. What do you say to someone who doesn't really understand this and is about to find out mm-hmm. about it all, but who would say that isn't that gunk the reality? Uh, I would argue no. Okay. <laughs> you know, I would I would say that all those things are distortions of reality. Okay. So I, I what do you that, yeah. what do you see as the reality of life? Then? Mm-hmm. I think uh, deep in our essence, there's something that exists beyond all of that. And I think if you look at even existentialism, right? You know, the existentialist talked about getting beyond what um, Sartre called bad faith, Nietzsche calls it something else, but getting beyond all the sort of lies we tell ourselves. Mm. And they get to sort of an existentialist dilemma, right? They feel like there's nothing underneath that because it feels like a void, right? Once you get into all that. Now, what we say is, okay, past what feels like a void, there's actually something else. 
And a lot of people who do meditation or those types of things yeah. talk about feeling, once they get past the void and the emptiness, some kind of light, something that's connected to everything. And, and a lot of us have had these types of experiences, these you know, higher consciousness experiences, whether mm. it's from a great instance of making love, whether sometimes you've done it, you know, in a, in a drug experience, like some, some experience. So is this, is like this anything to do with ayahuasca? Does that play a part in this? Or? Not in this. No. I would say okay. that some people can get to these peak experiences in different ways. Yeah. I mean, this ray really is through clearing out all the stuff that's between you and that right. deeper experience of yeah. life and yeah. that deeper connection that we all share yeah. um, in a very natural way. So, we, you know, I don't do anything I used to a long time ago, but not in the course of this path. I don't really do any kind of... Yeah. Any no, I've course. never done it, but I followed um, Terrence... Uh, guy, McKenna. McKenna. McKenna, yeah. I followed yeah. some of his stuff, and he went down yep. to South America and, yep. and, like, actually really, I think, did it as a very bona fide mm -hmm. um, educational oh, yeah. thing uh, from oh, yeah. a professorial point of view. and. One of the things I was really interested in his studies, he came up with the with the stone date mm -hmm. theory. Mm -hmm. But one of his uh, observations was that the guy who does ayahuasca or Silas mm -hmm. Oban or whatever it is in New York mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Wall Street mm -hmm. sees the same thing mm -hmm. because he was charting mm -hmm. what the images mm -hmm. were that a guy in the Amazon yep. jungle sees. Yeah, I can believe that. So there's this thought that mm -hmm. there's some secret in there that is otherworldly or something or that the human brain even if the right. brain has been maybe covered in right. gunk like right. a Wall Street guy right. um, keep talking to me about this reality well, what is the reality I, I think look I think just like we know uh, the electromagnetic spectrum although we can only see sort of the seven colors mm. is infinite right mm. we know there's you know infrared that we can't really see and there's ultraviolet that we can't really see and that that continues on and on yeah. so I think that that isn't all things. So we perceive a certain narrow band of reality. At other frequencies, there's other types of reality. Yeah. So ayahuasca, in theory, probably tunes our brains or our, our sensory perception to other bands. Right. So it makes sense that people would see the same thing, just right. like you and I are attuned to the same band right now, see the same tables and chairs. Okay, so the educational experience is about clearing the gunk away mm -hmm. it's a nice analogy you're then left with things like silence silence uh, you're uh, left with things like the basics of being a human being which is being, being good being. to people and yeah. stuff like that yeah and and a deep connection both to yourself to inner peace because you don't have all that trauma still yeah. and to everybody and everything else because yeah. when you get to the essential part I'll speak about myself when I got to a more essential part to my, of myself I felt much more connected with other human beings, yeah. um, with trees, plants, yeah. life. I mean, yeah. I think at the end of the day, the same thing animates all of us. Yeah. And if you can tap into that thing, it's like we're all in a sea of that stuff. Mm. But it's, it's hard to feel that when you're worried about work and you yeah. know, all the things you get worried about and yeah. get distracted in life. It, it's in the same bucket as yoga and it's in the of same course. bucket as meditation Everything and stuff like that. Yeah, after the same thing. This guy, you said in, in Chile, yep. was in the it was fifty years ago. He set it up. Yep. And is he still around? He's still around. Okay. Yeah, so tell yeah. me a little bit about his life. He, you know, he was brought up in a kind of prosperous family, an educational family in uh, Chile. Yeah. He always felt something was wrong in society, yeah. uh, uh, and sort of always saw felt like people were kind of play acting, and yeah. and felt like he. You know, saw through people yeah. in a sense, yeah. and over time, and he he sort of was able to connect with this work, which I think is yeah. a universal work. It's been passed down through generations. And, and what generations sort of philosophy? You call him a philosopher. Mm -hmm. What sort of philosophies does he like? What would be his his main three things that he would be sure. teaching? Sure. Well, I mean, a lot of it is self awareness. It's, at the end of the day, it comes down to you know really. Everything being like reflecting through yourself. So right. you know, understand that you're present here and that as I speak to you, I'm not just losing myself in what I'm saying to you and losing yeah. myself and projecting to the outside. I'm also monitoring my heart rate, right. my speech. I'm looking at, you know, am I trying to impress you? Am I accelerated? Or, you know, so it's self knowledge yeah. at the end mm -hmm. of the day. When know thyself was on the top of the temple of Delphi, it's sort of yeah. something that's sort of a known initiatic thing. And yeah. know thyself is a very deep concept the more you understand what it is. I agree. Yeah. I, I think that we, we don't study philosophy. A, a previous guest of mine, Glenn Condy, on this mm -hmm. show 
talks about living in France and how you know philosophy is on the curriculum of kids yeah, in France. I know. But here, on, and even in my what are you going to do countries, with that? Yeah. <laughs> so, huh? How do you spell it? But I get I you know another observation here is and I know I know I know it's very beneficial to people mm-hmm. and I'm not knocking it mm-hmm. but nearly everywhere I look here people have got you know psychiatrists mm-hmm. and psychologists on board and they're seeing people and mm-hmm. they're trying to come to terms. I mean, is it fair to say there's more gunk in this city than there is in practically any other in the there's, world? There's a lot of gunk here. I mean, there I think is. everybody has their own gunk, yeah. but New York has a special kind of gunk. It does. <laughs> I mean, it's hard, right? There's so many people in this, this society, I guess you call it, in New York, but people feel so constricted in their little bubbles. Yeah. And it, it, to have so many different kinds of people, yeah. but have most people not really interact with people who aren't like them still, yeah. where yeah. we're all packed together so tightly, is an interesting phenomenon. I, yeah. I see that a lot. If you think about the subway in New York, where, again, we're all packed tightly in this space, but no one's looking at each other in the no. eye. And that's a very interesting kind of symbol for I mean, self, uh, <laughs> self-awareness is, is not a huge jump to selfishness or vanity or stuff like well, that. Well, so it can be. To find the difference. Yeah, so it's a, it's a great difference. So vanity, I start using kind of terms, vanity really sits in the ego and the false self. Right. That's not your essential self. Yeah. That is really puffing yourself up with whether you have a lot of money or a lot of beauty. You're still okay. defining yourself from the outside. Okay. You're saying, because I have X. Yeah. I'm smart, I'm beautiful, I'm, I have some attribute, therefore, I am better than. Okay. Um, that, in a sense, is, is sort of right. ego, vanity, those types of things. But when you get to a deeper sense of self, you realize that those things are really meaningless, in a sense. I mean, they're meaningful in, in a sense that well, they you, know, you need them, right? And, and to get in this sort of three-dimensional society, I, I have a job, I have to spend money, i got to yeah. pay for my apartment. But in any way to define myself that's it's sort of a joke it's like a cardboard cutout or a facsimile yeah. of, a, of a person rather yeah. than a real person and when you realize that you, all that stuff fades and then yeah. you go well, what's what's left you know once I realize that defining myself from anything on the outside is um, false yeah what's really there yeah, yeah and that's where the sort of existentialist dilemma happens right it's like yeah. oh my god who am I who am I who am I and then if you go deeper, you find something that's that's more universal. There was a theory going around uh, that apparently science is taking more credibly than whether or not there's a god, mm-hmm. uh, which is that we may all be part of a video game. Yeah, you can see that. Which is, quite a, which is quite a nice <laughs> thought to think about. But when you actually start thinking about that idea, a couple of things come straight to your head mm-hmm. when you talk about this existential nihilist sort yeah. of thing. There's a huge nihilistic strength to this, yeah. which is that everything is for now, right? Yeah. If we're just a video game. And the idea, the, the concept has been talked about to the point where the reason we don't understand infinity is it's a bit like, you know, when, when um, Truman, in the Truman Show, yeah. crashed like, into, yeah. The, yeah. In, into the horizon. Yeah. That, that's one just the barrier. One of my favorite movies. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, Truman and, yeah. and, and, and also before it, yeah. uh, Groundhog yeah. Day, yeah. you know, have big the ideas Matrix. in them. Exactly, the Matrix. Yeah. But you have this thing where the reason we can't understand infinity is because it's the barrier of the, of the game. Mm-hmm. That's, it's just the program mm-hmm. ends. And all art is for nothing. All mm-hmm. war is for mm-hmm. nothing. And I, I like to go around when I talk about this theory. And anyone who talks about the theory dies. Yeah. So if I die in yeah. the next couple of days, yeah. just get this out. <laughs> How do you feel about that kind of, when you get down mm-hmm. to brass tacks, yeah. meaning of life mm-hmm. can very quickly... Mm-hmm drive down that road? Right. So uh, it's a fantastic question. And I used to be uh, traumatized by that question. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, at this point, because I do believe that, like I said, if you get back to the essence, there is something essential. There's an essential being. There's a part, there's a, there's a particle of light. Or stardust. Whatever, or stardust, whatever yeah. you want to call it, that exists inside of each one of us. And when you connect to that, that connects us to, to, to the infinite, to the universe, yeah. um, at least in my comprehension of that right. and my experience. I also believe that we can grow that light. The more awareness we have, the more moments of this consciousness we have, that light can actually get brighter. The idea of, to talk about different you know, religions, I think religions were all you know, in, enlightened beings in the beginning, and then it's a game of telephone that just that got yeah. you, know, you know it got bastardized yeah, over yeah. you know eons, and mm. then people started using it for the wrong reasons. But if you go back to like what the Buddha said, or what Jesus actually said, yeah. or what there's there's a lot of truth in those things. Yeah. And so if you think about those depictions of halos or glowing beings yeah. or a heart that's on yeah. fire, a lot of depictions of of light. Yes. And I do believe that this word enlightenment is an actual thing. Yes. You know, that this little particle 
can get bigger and bigger and yeah. bigger. Um, and that's part of the teaching of the school. It's part of my own experience. So we're here for that. You know, yeah. We're here actually to actually grow that light because just like if I talk about a spiritual gym, the Institute's sort of like a spiritual gym, just like in a gym, if there weren't weights, you couldn't get any stronger. So you need inertia. You need something pushing against you mm. to grow that light. I mean, so the world in essence is a school. It's a, it's a, it's a series Learning of tests. Yeah. And so it's not all for naught as long as you understand that function. Yeah. That if you actually think this is all you know, real, in, you know, in the Bill Hicks kind of way, and yeah. if, you, if you don't yeah. understand this is kind of a ride, it's just a ride. or it's kind of a <laughs> test, yeah. then yeah, then you're running around you know, chasing your tail. Mm. But the minute you understand, okay, I'm here for a reason, and I'm here to experience this world and grow my eternal being, and everything that comes at me, whether it's you know money problems or relationship problems or whatever it is, is an opportunity for me to grow, an opportunity right. for me to understand more about myself, how I created this problem, yeah. you know, and how can I uncreate it? How can? But I, I mean, with, with, with that very laudable and ideology that's full of integrity, yeah. you know, we're in a we're in sludge right now. We're getting sludgier. Are. Yep, absolutely. I mean, there's, I mean, I, yep. I, get, I get the fact well, that there are a few people here and there trying to. I, are we really getting sludgier? So I, I see two things happening. Okay. I see I see Donald Trump and a whole bunch of crazy cr- crap going on. Mm-hmm. But I also see Oprah with a channel about spirituality that you never would have seen. I, and I never would be talking yeah. to my work, you know, people about my spiritual work, you know, twenty years ago, even mm-hmm. ten years ago. Like we didn't even talk about it much. You know, so it's it's the fact that we're able to talk about this. Um, I do believe there's a rise in global consciousness among some, and yeah. I also believe that the dark side is getting stronger. Yeah. And I think both things are happening. The enlightened or the intelligent amongst us do know that there, I think, is, even if there's nothing after life, which mm-hmm. is, was the reason religion was probably set up, there is within us some innate something that yeah. we don't know what it is yeah, yet. I, I've God always said, do you believe in God? I go, yeah. yes, but no, but I think there's something we don't know yet. Right. I think there's something Stephen Hawking doesn't right. know yet. Absolutely. Absolutely. And until we get that, right. and maybe God appears, you know, right. Garabandal, he's meant to appear next right. year, folks, <laughs> on March the 17th mm-hmm. or something. Maybe something like that happens, yeah. and that rocks the whole world. Mm-hmm. But what was your what was your background, and where did mm-hmm. you end up getting to this point? So I grew up uh, suburbs of Baltimore, Maryland. Um, okay. I also, as a child, remember feeling different <laughs> and feeling not understanding right. why people were the way they were I'd watch you know a uh, single mom my dad was around for the first seven years but then you know right. left and watching um, people go to work come back eat dinner go to work come back eat dinner and yeah. feeling like there had to be more to life this this couldn't be all there was yeah were you working class or uh, yeah work my mom grew up she was my mom was a um, teacher my okay. dad left and then right. worked up through the ranks and became assistant superintendent. Okay. Uh, so very working class, descendant of slaves, I mean, black American yeah. uh, on both sides. Mm. Um, both my families were farmers, you know, after sort of slavery, they kind of, you know, farmed. And my dad was the first generation in college. My mom was, I think, actually third generation in college on her side, which okay. was very rare for yeah, yeah. Americans. But uh, when I was 13, I... Uh, did okay on a standardized test and ended up getting a scholarship to uh, Andover uh, boarding school. Um, and then from there, I went on to, to Brown University. And through all that, I just was questioning everything. You know, I just, you know, I just started looking at, you know, what makes us tick and when. Mm. And so I ended up, I changed my major four times at Brown. Wow. Uh, started out in international relations, then economics, then English, and right. then philosophy. I ended up great major, you know, okay. majoring in philosophy right, right. and really got into existentialism. And you know, yeah. there's certain... You know, Saturday nights, instead of going out, I would sit there and, and read Nietzsche and kind of <laughs> <laughs> go, you know, and try, trying to figure out yeah. what, why we were the way we were. Yeah. My first job out of college was uh, on Wall Street, actually, back oh, in Baltimore, really? but a very, you know, high-powered job at a, at a mutual I fund. Okay. I hated it. Was it like Wolf of Wall Street? <laughs> uh, well, at that time, it was a mutual fund, so it wasn't quite like okay. that. I did trading, which was much more like Wolf yeah, of Wall yeah, Street. Yeah, yeah. I had one day when I remember I had a corner office, believe it or not, and I looked over the Baltimore Harbor, and I saw my reflection in these two windows. Brilliant. And one was, you know, if I stayed in that life, and I saw yeah. myself getting older in this crumpled suit, yeah. and wealthy but not happy. 
and the Clenched. other one, yeah, just I just felt like I, yeah. that future wasn't yeah. going to be a good future. Mm. And then I saw another one where I didn't know know what it was, but it was, yeah. I saw like that was supposed to be my path, and I needed to get back on my yeah. path. So I actually left uh, the job after six months, and my my mom and, and my dad. They freaked out yeah. because you know they spent so much money to send me to these schools. I yeah. had this ideal job, and I went. Oh, off, you're a letdown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I went yeah. back to Brown and and started studying theater. And wow. uh, so I that never was knew the, the theater right. side of life. I didn't go back. I didn't have money to go back to school, but I uh, sat in all these classes. I had teachers who saw that I had fire in my eye and, mm. and passion, and they let me sit in for two years yeah. in classes. And I got a mentor who's no longer with us, but who was one of the teachers of the playwriting program and really mentored me. And I produced plays and wrote plays and acted and yeah. directed. And, Let's give you my one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I came to New York and started a theater company and did that for three years here. I worked at the public theater and that was sort of my passion. And even right. that was about understanding the masks we're all living. Because yeah, you know, yeah. theater is all about the mask, right? Yeah. And, and in, in the best drama, in sort of traditional drama, it was about, us. that's why the symbols are these masks, right? It's unmasking the mm. false to get to the real. Um, whatever is essential in human beings, and, and Goes right theater back, yeah. tends to do that through mm. crisis and catharsis, right? Um, so all, you know, all that was part of my search. Um, you were brave, in because you 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 know you would have been throwing away the big bucks. I did throw away the big bucks. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And then yeah, <laughs> and, and but like to parents, that's what the hell are you doing? Oh, they 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 really yelled at me a and, lot. Uh, are you an only child? Uh, no, I have a no. sister who's okay. uh, very successful. She's in academia. Uh, Is she older than a, you? Two years younger. Okay. So she's a MacArthur Genius Grant winner. Okay, and, great. Uh, you know, the National Academy of Sciences. You had, you had, you, you, at least your parents passed on good genes uh, to you. Well, yeah. I, I am thankful to them for yeah. education and, and whatever they do. Were you were still involved in this sort of higher order thinking at that stage or was that what, was that it a was, catalyst? To it was something you? in me that was driving me to find whatever it was that I was supposed to do with my life. I just knew somehow, I couldn't, I couldn't explain it at that time. I just knew there was something I was supposed to be doing with my life, and I had this burning desire to find it. I, I've sort of found it over time. I, I know now that I'm doing the thing I'm supposed to be doing with my life, yeah. you know, which to me is, is, is the, one of the greatest feelings on the planet. Yeah, to sort of it walk is. In, in your feet knowing you're on the right path. Yeah, um, yeah. And I wandered for a very long time and did lots How of How long have you been feeling like that? Like with like pure surety for 10 of the years I've been Great. in the school. Okay. Um, but for when I first found the schools, let me explain how I found the school. I, I, I did a bunch of things. I became a Buddhist. I did a bunch of stuff. But I was in a bookstore. And by then, I would at least learned to follow my intuition. And in this bookstore, it was like my hand shot down on this table. And I picked up this book. And I opened it up. And I read the first couple of pages. And my whole body started shaking. Wow. What's and the name like of the book? A Stellar Man by Stellar this guy, Man. Dario Salas Summer. Um, he goes by John Baines. That's his name. And I read the first couple of pages, and, and literally everything inside me started shaking. And I took the book home, and I read it in a day. Wow, I must uh, get it. And uh, I'll, I'll share it with you. And, uh, and then I got it. There was a second book to it. I read that in a day, and there was a number at the back. And I remember calling that number and saying, oh, my God, I read these books. And the voice <laughs> on the other, other end, who's, a, who's now a mentor of mine, was like, and you feel like you, you've heard this before. And I was like, yes, oh, wow. my God. And, and uh, I found out about this meeting, and I... You know, went there and I immediately felt like this was what I was supposed to be doing. Yeah. I, I couldn't explain it. I just knew that somehow I was on the right path in my wow. life. And, um, absolutely. Now I quite like. I mean, I've read yeah. Eckhart Tolle yeah. stuff and Power Now. I thought yep. it was a great book. And you know, mm -hmm. I, I did a bit of uh, a bit of that yep. self help. I guess it's not. That's not a really nice name for it. it. I mean, it's sort it's, of the watered down side. But the thing yeah. about Eckhart Tolle is that he sort of woke up one day on a park bench. You know, yeah. so he doesn't actually say this is how you. This is what you do. Yeah. <laughs> like this yeah. is how you do it. He's actually pretty good at explaining the the feeling of being more conscious and explaining mm. the pain body and the feeling body and yeah. all that stuff. But he doesn't say what do you do. Yeah. Um, and how, what are the steps that you take to actually awaken yeah um, whereas this work really does it's a step-by-step -step guide to sort of awaken if you put yourself through it and do the stuff you're gonna you're gonna get well, I'll definitely have to read that and uh, we'll, I'll, I'll try and post it on the uh, blurb sure. for the uh, podcast so that people can find it at the end I wanted to talk a little bit about I'm, I'm Facebook pals mm -hmm. with you and you, you you do spend a lot of your time yep. tackling the race issue yep. in America mm -hmm. as it is now and I mean I think it's <laughs> Fucking terrible. It's, it's yeah, I mean, I'm an Irish guy here. So, you know, <laughs> the guns and the race thing are the two things I like, smack my head most. Yeah. Most people back home just yeah. can't understand it. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about, because I, I also think you do it in a very intelligent Thank way you. and you do it in a way that's not 
shrieky. Give me your feeling on, on you know, how that was your, mm-hmm. your background affected mm-hmm. that. I, I mm-hmm. got wind, mm-hmm. sort of sense of that from mm-hmm. some of your earlier comments. Mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, let's start with this. I mean, Black Lives Matter is, is huge right now. Mm-hmm. And the idea that, uh, you know, African Americans just statistically, just look at statistics and it's undeniable that yeah. African Americans are, are shot beaten, incarcerated, <laughs> jailed, executed. I mean, uh, executed way more, you know, for yeah. similar offenses than than anyone else. Mm. Uh, you know, and that's just, that's a pure fact. Yeah. Um, whether or not people choose to admit that is is, part, yeah. is why we have a debate, yeah. which there shouldn't even be a, yeah. be a debate. When, when you say Black Lives Matter, the fact that someone even has anything else to say is, is crazy to me. But I use it as a segue to say that when I was 11, I went with my grandmother to Dallas, Texas. and Where uh, I lived for a bit. Uh, <laughs> so obviously, you know, in the early '80s in Dallas, mm. my, my my grandmother was a medical technologist. Was at a conference that uh, we were staying at, uh, not an amazingly nice hotel, but obviously a hotel that was a little too nice for us, according to some people. Really? So I was walking into my own room by myself, and I, I out of the corner of my eye, I do remember someone walking by, yeah, and in, down the other hallway, and I guess that person must have felt like I was breaking in, of course, because I was a young black man. You know, but you were 11. 11. Yeah. But now, Tamir Rice was Tamir Rice, 12. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, to a certain person, I yeah, must yeah, have yeah. looked like 25, yeah. right? And so uh, my grandmother was actually, actually, my grandmother was in the room, thank God, because uh, maybe about 10 minutes later, I think I got undressed and to go to the pool, which we were on the first floor and there's a pool yeah. out there. And when I opened the door towards the pool, yeah. like eight cops were there with their guns drawn, like, <laughs> oh my God, I'll kill you. You know, I mean, really. I crap my pants. Yeah. I'm like, what? What did I do? And you know, and thank God I didn't have a wallet in my hand or, yeah. or, or, or uh, a, a water comb pistol or a water pistol <laughs> or you know, moved too quickly or yeah. anything. Or yeah. I might not be here yeah. having this conversation with you yeah. today. And I was just like, what? Yeah. And, I, and then luckily my grandmother was there, and I was like, my grandmother's here, and we're here together. And they went in and they checked everything out, and okay, okay, okay. But that's. How can I not be so passionate about that? I almost died, <laughs> you know. And the thing is, you know, and I'm a relatively preppy kid from yeah. the suburbs, yeah. And I've been at police gunpoint three times in my life Have you for really? no reason. So this is a real issue. <laughs> I, can, <laughs> I can tell you that I have yeah. never been at police. Of course but, not. And I probably have. have. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, and all my black friends have. Yeah. You know, that's the thing. It's 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 so obvious. You know, we just have different. Uh, I, I would say some of the times I might have been at police well, gunpoint. They did, the police didn't have guns. Exactly. There you go, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's just you know, we, we live in two Americas, yeah. and, and and that's such a fact. And I, mm. I, I know lots of friends from all different you know race, yeah. religions, creeds, classes, and you know when we're honest with each other, mm. we live in different societies, yeah. even if we live in the same neighborhood. I think it's just important to acknowledge that, mm. and that's the we've got to like have that discussion on a real level and not deny. I lived it. in Dallas for about a year. Uh, I didn't really agree with me, uh, but I, I did want to see the upfrontness of it, mm-hmm. and it's definitely upfront. Oh yeah, but I find it nearly worse because there's a stupidity that goes with mm-hmm. it. There's a gun stupidity yeah. in Texas. Yeah. Their, their 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 rationalization for guns is kind of hysterical. <laughs> yeah. But I find it worse up here because in places like Boston and even in New York, denial. it's still... Well, it's not even denial. It's it's what Trump's allowing to come out now. Yes. It's the fact that people are thinking but exactly. not saying. Well, that's what I mean. That's what I mean by the yeah. sort of denial of yeah. it. It's like, you know... And I prefer to have the debate with the person who's mm-hmm. able to oh, be yeah. up front about it. I agree. It because I'm not going to hit them. I agree. But I will have, yeah. I prefer them to not be, this insidious mm-hmm. hidden mm-hmm. racism is the worst type. I, I think, so thank goodness I do all the spiritual work, frankly, because, <laughs> you know, the idea that, this is back to statistics, you know, one in 10 white people will, will literally say that they think black people are inferior. <laughs> and four in 10 say that, you know, we're not doing well just because we're lazier. You know, and, yeah, and that's yeah. just people who actually admit it. So this idea, but not that, as lazy as Mexicans. No, of course not. <laughs> you know, and so the idea, and this is this is a challenge for. And you grow up African American, you read sort of the literature, sort of never knowing who might have some bias and who might yeah. not. A lot of people just shut down and say, "Well, you know, I just don't. I'm not going to deal with them." You know, because it's yeah. like you know, there's the thinking and not say it, mm. and then there's the real subconscious stuff mm. that, where it's like you don't even know it. You know, mm. you cross the street on a you know on a dark night, but you would never say, "No, no, not me." Yeah, you know, I'm not racist. So there's so many levels to yeah. it. And 
trying to navigate that as an African American is extremely challenging. Yeah, because <laughs> you just ne- you never know at what level you're dealing with. I was at a, a very prominent firm, one of the top four digital companies right now, um, probably top two. I was at a half day workshop where I saw nine white males between the ages of 30 and 45 speak at me for you know three and a half hours, four right. hours, and I'm just thinking doesn't anyone even notice this? Yeah, it's yeah. like being white yeah. male is sort of the norm. Even yeah. if you saw nine white women talk to yeah. you in yeah. four hours, someone would go, what's up with all the women? Yeah. You know? And, yeah, and exactly. If you exactly. definitely saw you know, nine black people yeah. talking to you, you'd be like, why is it all black? But why doesn't anyone think <laughs> if there's nine white guys? Like, why isn't that strange? Yeah. You know? Because there's sort of whiteness and maleness is sort of the norm yeah. uh, for an authority. Yeah. And that all sits embedded in our subconscious. Yeah which is why we don't think it's odd yeah. when we create these kinds of sessions, which is why we're hiring. That sense of authority sort of is like, oh, that person seems like he's well qualified. The <laughs> diamond in the rough, because we're talking mainly about creative industries. Mm-hmm. Yep. But when you look at music. Oh, yeah, of course. And again, you know, coming as an Ar- speaking mm-hmm. as an Irish guy, one yeah. of the people say, how come the Irish have so many playwrights and writers yeah. and poets? Suffer. Well, yeah, people pick up the <laughs> yeah, pen exactly. and they write. Yeah. <laughs> music yeah. and that goes all the way of back course. to slavery of and course, you know yeah. and and yet you look at these other industries like acting mm-hmm. we have a problem in hollywood we have a problem right. in advertising right. which is white man domain right. exactly. and there's white business man but the music yeah. business because it's mm-hmm. i guess you can pick up a guitar and you can write yeah. and you can well, even now you yeah. can put it out on the internet yeah. and hit, be hit overnight Music affects us differently. We don't really usually, like, uh, mostly see the musicians. Like, most of the time we're listening to music, we we rate it for its its musicianship, right? Whereas film, you know, we're seeing that. And the stories we choose to see are almost the same story over and over again. I mean, Mm. it's usually white male saves the world, gets the woman. You know, whether that's a superhero story, whether that's a, you know, I mean, it's it's story that's sort of that story that Hollywood tells over and over again. Because that's a very safe story and a story we're yes. used to. And it, we, no, black people are in films because they're black. My, <laughs> my friend Craig Damrauer, who yeah. was also a guest on Find Which Only Be, was is doing a great project called All the Black People in Citizen Kane. Mm. Oh my God! And basically, what it is, basically what he's doing is he's taking every frame of the whole movie right. and he's white outing everything except the black people. And wow. There's something like 22 black over two wow. hours. So all you see is the sound wow. and a white screen, and then occasionally wow. a, like one's a taxi <laughs> yeah, driver. Yeah, there's three only, bands. I can only and, imagine yeah. like they're black people in it's, Citizen Kane. It's a amazing project that he's doing and of course you know he he, it's a labor of love and it's taking forever to do but it's a great it's a great idea so let's just cross both of those Mm -hmm. wires now and Mm -hmm. say we have a need to be more present and conscious in Mm -hmm. the world coupled with i think probably a stalled a stalled state of affairs when it comes to racism and diversity Mm -hmm. or a or in reverse yeah i was going to say or in reverse It, it might be that it's being Make, we're, we're more aware of it because everyone has a phone there's that's a, a camera you there's know more aware of it but also there's a backlash to to a black president yeah I mean of course yeah, of so, course yeah know. I mean a lot of it probably just come I down to that a significant number I, I saw some statistic that it's like a significant number of white people actually think that you know um, prejudice against white people is stronger than against black people it's like 40 <laughs> percent well, something like it's well. like a, it's like a big number <laughs> how does the apart from maybe giving you possibly a cooler mind, which is critical, yeah. I guess, how does the awareness side of things work with that? Well, I think you know when you say that I'm able to sort of stay calm and kind of have have these conversations, I have you know sort of detached myself from the anger. Right? There's a lot of yes. anger. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, there's there. I mean, that police incident hurt. The first Which time, one? Uh, exactly. The first time, you know, when I was a little kid, I remember. Oh, your one, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. my, my yeah, 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 yeah. one I was talking about. Eleven, um, yeah. Yeah, I remember the first time, you know, I realized I was black and that was inferior. You know, I remember uh, talking to a little girl in a store and she hid when I just wanted to say hi. And she's like, I'm not allowed to talk to black people. Wow. And I had to understand what that meant. Out of the math of And babes. it meant that I was like somehow worse than yeah. other people. Yeah. And yeah. that, you know, and then, you know, obviously we talk about the indoctrination, mm. especially, t- you know, <laughs> 70s TV where it's like, again, black people are always pimps or yeah, prostitutes yeah, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. You know, I could never be the six million dollar man. I could no. never be anybody like that. Huggy you know, Bear. Huggy was, Bear. Was, yeah. You know, yeah. he was I the only be, one. You know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, that stuff sits inside you. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of my work actually 
has been to overcome the inferiority complex that's imposed upon African Americans in the society because um, that was deep in my subconscious. Yeah. And a lot of the anger comes out of that because there's sort of two ways you deal with that inferiority complex. <clears throat> there is anger, like, fuck you, I'm not, you know, yeah. I'm not less than you. Yeah. Or there's subservience, you know, or, or you become, you know, yeah, you know, sort up. of field slave, house slave mentality, yeah, yeah. Um, which uh, Malcolm X talked about a lot. Yeah. Once you can free yourself of that mental slavery, uh, as Bob Marley said, you can be free inside, internally free, and be able just to talk about what it is yeah. without all your triggers getting pulled. Um, and so I have a sense of freedom, not just from that, because mm. that's just one aspect of, of my conditioning, but it's a big aspect of my conditioning. Yeah. So, so it lets me be, be more free in life about yeah. everything. I can't see the way out of it. How, how do we get out of this, apart from maybe everyone becoming really deep into, into mm -hmm. spirituality and meditation, which ain't going to happen? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, gen obviously generationally things are changing, right? I live a life that my parents, grandparents could never have lived. So yeah. things are changing generationally. Um, while things are still slowly. challenging, they're changing incredibly slowly. Um, not to say I'm okay with that. I just have to acknowledge that, right? Yeah. That, you know, like my, my yeah, grandmother, yeah, yeah. where she passed away, looked at my life and was astonished that I could be... Yeah. In, in the Mad Men days, you know, I'd have been you know, running the elevator no matter how smart yeah. I was. You know, yeah. it's like, so, and I have to, have to acknowledge that. Yeah. And a lot of those guys running the elevator were probably as smart as me and just yeah. had, didn't have a shot. Not to say I'm super smart, I'm just saying that. You know, I think you are super smart. I, We've already covered you know, that whatever, biography. I yeah, <laughs> appreciate that and just not lauding myself. That being said, I think racial bias, uh, I call it racial bias rather than saying you're racist, right. is on a spectrum. Some people have more or less, but almost all of us have it. Mm -hmm. uh, Harvard has this really in interesting in implicit bias test called the IAT that almost anyone can take. And what you find is that almost everybody has implicit bias. Yeah. And almost all of us have it against black people. Right. Because we've all been conditioned the same way. Yeah. So even I, again, I saw the same TV that everybody else saw, that yeah. black people are pimps and prostitutes yeah. and da da da. So, you know, even I sometimes have yeah. to work through my own, you know, yeah, stuff yeah, against yeah. black people. It lives in our subconscious. So mm -hmm. even the most well-meaning person yeah. in a moment of crisis or something like that, yeah. their, their bias may come out. You know, the person who called the police on me when I was 11 and, you know, was moving to mm. the door may not have been an outright racist. Mm. But to that person, because of her conditioning, yeah. she saw someone breaking into yeah. a room. I and know. that's what she saw. So I think oh, if it was an eleven-year-old white boy, she wouldn't have done anything. Of course not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's it's. I think it's the implicit bias. That's why I don't use words like you're a racist or you're not mm. a racist. Because mm. in a sense, we all have racial bias. Some have it more pronounced. Some some people it's obviously more conscious and, and yeah. willful. For a lot of us, and I include myself in it, yeah. um, it's unconscious. And I think we all have to. That's the conversation we need to have. Is that we we all got, you know, created in the same stew of a country that was built on racism. Right. I mean, think about the mental conditioning that had to happen to convince an entire people that they were animals, yeah. and to convince the people who were treating like like animals that they were animals. Yeah, so yeah. you know, they were it, owned. It, yeah. so the people, the owners, got the same conditioning than the ownees. So to sit there and have human beings on a auction block and yeah. to be trading them like cows. Everybody there was brainwashed, you yeah. know, and we're all dealing with the yeah. effects of that brainwashing that exists in our school books, exists yeah. in our, you know, everything I talked about before. That stuff still exists. And that's only six generations, you know, uh, yeah. six seven generations. It's right? it's it's six generations racism, and it's yeah. uh, from from slavery, and it's only. I mean, my mother. Oh no, it's still going. It's one yeah, yeah. generation yeah, yeah, from yeah. Jim Crow. I mean, yeah, my mother yeah, wasn't yeah, allowed yeah. to change clothes in a department store yeah. uh, to try on stuff yeah. because she was black. And that's my mom. What is the way out of it? What is the solution? Mm -hmm. I do, I mean, I wouldn't be on Facebook having these conversations if yeah. I didn't think conversations led somewhere. Yeah. I mean, I have great friends, I guess, that evolve races, I and mean, this conversation's a fantastic conversation. Yeah. I think we get there by having that conversation. Mm. I hope we can have a national conversation. Mm. But I think it takes those of us who can have that conversation in a, in a moderate way, in a yeah. way, and keep it without all the inflammatory yeah. dialogue on, on both sides. Yeah. I think that's super important. And I, and I do believe that conscious awareness, and I, you know, the more we have of that, the more people do the introspect and think about themselves. Yeah. Uh, I think things are going to get better. What would be your one thing that you would want to leave somebody, say that eleven-year-old boy? What would you want to say to him now from this part of your life, looking back? Follow your gut. Uh, a lot of people say that. A lot of people say that. 
Anyway, there's no doubt that one of the biggest gunks on the windshield of life, as you said at the start of this podcast, is racism, and I hope we can clean that one off first. Dave Richardson, it was great. Thank you so much for coming on A Pint with Shoney B, and keep the fight going, brother, and uh, I'll support you as much as I can, and uh, also going to look into this little book of yours. Absolutely. Thanks, Thanks. man. It was fantastic.